How many people know without looking at it what Hebrews 11 is all about? Oh, uh, prophecy. Uh, no. 11. <laughs> Hebrews 11. It's often faith. called the hall of, yeah, faith. Yeah, faith and prophetic yep. message. <laughs> 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 almost, Tom, almost. Okay. okay, how many people have heard the verse now? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yeah. seen. Okay. okay, there's so many verses, like pop verses that are quoted from the book of Hebrews, right, that we get all these messages from, and we're, we're kind of, um, oh, thank you, Jesus. We're kind of, like, debunking a lot of it a lot of just what people they they cherry pick verses and they just take this stuff and create and a lot of it's good you know you can do that um but you know a lot of it's out of context completely and um and so what we're doing in this whole study is saying like okay all these nice verses that we get the the word of god is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword you know now faith is the things hope for the substance of things not seen and and uh you know the stuff about judgment and the lord the lord will will judge his people first you know that thing we'll get that in hebrews 12 we're taking these and we're saying no okay we're putting them like puzzle pieces into this big picture of the message of the book which is all about the finished work of christ and it's about calling people out of a fading dying religious system of judaism into rest calling them into rest into faith and grace and so um you know i put a note here that it, that it's okay if you take things out of context sometimes you, i don't want to be a context nazi all right, and saying that like, all right, everything has to fall in line no with the whole. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it's okay to do that. We're not we're not going to be you know religious about the whole thing about being non-religious, but you know because you can do that. But but there is such peace, there is such um, joy, there's such freedom that comes when we when we hear the right word of God. All right, when you hear His pure word. Okay, there's such a beautiful sound that proceeds from the mouth of our Father, okay? There's such good words, okay? In the book of Proverbs, it says a good word releases us from anxiety. I love that. I don't know where it is, but it says a good, a good word will, will take, I see it. take, you take anxiety from know. your is heart. It really in there? Come on. <laughs> you can look it up, Tom. <laughs> so God's word is good, right? We know God is good. And so if if you're not hearing his pure word, then you're going to miss out on the full goodness of what that word is. And so a lot of people take his word like sound bites, you know. And let, let's say, you know, you took a, a great speech by Martin Luther King, right, Jr. You took his I Have a Dream speech, beautiful, famous speech. And you were to just like cherry pick certain verses and like paste it together in your own agenda. And like, let's say, you know, you had this very like almost a hate filled agenda. So you were taking... Martin Luther King's speech, which was all about unity and love, and you're and you were cherry picking it out, and you know you could very much paint an image to the next generation of Martin Luther King, which would be a very dark image of who Martin Luther King was. You could do that with anybody. I mean, the news does that all the time. They take little blips, sound blips, out of people's mouths. They quote one little line, right, and then they feed it to you, and then they you know they they tar tarnish this person's image. So you could do that, and that's what people, unfortunately, a lot of preachers, teachers do with God. They tarnish his image because they cherry pick and they take all this stuff out. But when you really read the full counsel of the Lord, when you when you put it all together and you um and you receive the goodness of his word and you receive the whole counsel of it, it's there there's just that peace that flows and you get to understand the heart of God. So that's what we're doing with this whole study, okay? And in Hebrews 11, we're, we're not taking a break to go on a tangent about faith. Okay, we're, we're putting faith in the context of the finished work of the cross and everything that we've learned up until this point because he's just finished his whole teaching on what Christ has accomplished, entering into that rest, avoiding the judgment that comes upon Jerusalem, upon the fading religious system, the law, <coughs> staying in that place of rest, staying in that place of that union with Christ, and now faith is simply him um, expanding upon that reality and, um, and teaching us how to really apply these truths to our lives, okay, in light of that. So let me, let me just pray to open this up with this. Um, Father, right now I just ask that a spirit of wisdom and revelation would uh, fall upon this place, that you would um, 
really tune the ears of our hearts to what you are saying. I pray that you would just give me clarity of speech and boldness of speech to declare your word this morning. Father, I thank you that you are poised and ready. You, you are like standing on tiptoe waiting to show mercy to your people, waiting to show grace and strength to your people. You, you look to and fro across the earth for, for someone that you can show yourself faithful to. That is what your word says, God. You wait. You wait upon us, God, to, to bless us, Lord. You wait upon us. You wait to shower, to lavish your goodness upon us. So, Father, I thank you that that is the approach that we take before you. We come to you knowing that you wait and you, you long to show us your grace. You long to be gracious to us. So, Father, we come to you right now. We come right before you, Father. You, you are in our midst. You are here. You are for us. And we just ask together that you would lavish your grace on us through your word this morning, that you would just pour out your goodness, that you would give us revelation about this issue of faith, God, we, we, we've received so many teachings on faith, Lord. There's so much stuff out there about faith, and, 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 and I really think a lot of it has uh, really put more burden on your people than has released your people into rest, which is what faith is all about. And so, Lord, I just pray that in your goodness, in your mercy, Lord, in your kindness, that you would so shower us with, with pure revelation this morning, God, that you would just completely speak to our hearts, that you would release a good word to us that would release anxiety and fear from our hearts and bring us into the peace and the joy and the kindness and the gentleness that you desire us to, to live in. So, Father, I thank you for this right now. I thank you for all of the gifts that you lavish on us, for all of the goodness, Father, for your presence here. We thank you, God. We worship you, Father. We praise you. Thank you so much, God. Thank you, Father. Oh. I could just get carried away. I could just get carried away. <laughs> I just keep getting little snapshots. It's really that simple. It's really that simple. I just crack yeah. up. Yeah. 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 We're sitting here playing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I just I wanted to allow for a moment there just for us to focus on what this is all about. I mean, I could we could do the teaching. We could talk about that. We can go through the notes, but... Come on, without that revelation of his goodness, you know, you're not going to receive the fullness of, of what he wants to give to you, you know. Faith is really a, a response to some, to, in your, to the heart that knows that God is good. You know, that, I think that's, that's one definition I heard of faith that I really like. That's not in the notes. That's not what we're going to talk about. But, but part of faith is, is simply becoming aware of how good God is. And it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier, me and Frank, about my daughter being sick this past week and how that actually increased my own faith to ask for healing in things because I had such a heart as a father to see my daughter whole and healed. Like I would, you know, I, I would take away that sickness in a moment. I'd take that on myself just so she wouldn't have to be sick. And so I just, this revelation comes like, wow, and God is better than me. <laughs> He's a better father than me. How could I ever doubt that he wouldn't want to heal, you know? And, and so the more that you know how good God is, the more your faith is built up. And I, I really believe the quicker that you receive answers to prayer because you're praying with an open heart, ready to receive the gifts that he wants to lavish on you, you know. And how good that you're just in that mindset to always be looking to see what God's saying and yeah. being so open. Yeah. That you can see that, you know, Annabelle's being ill. Look, yeah. look what God taught you through all that. Like, not that he wanted her sick, but yeah. how wonderful is that? That yeah. through the everyday yeah. comings and goings, God yes. reveals himself. And that's due in part, too, to your openness. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. So, let's just take those say laws every once in a while. Let's just breathe that in, okay? <laughs> As we go through this teaching, um... We're going to finish up in the next three weeks, by the way, and um, 
we're going to take a break for the early early service for a little while, and then we're going to start up again sometime in February with uh, with a whole uh, teaching training thing on hearing the voice of God and growing in how to hear God's voice and all that stuff. So I'll talk about that more later, but um, but we've got a lot to cover still in Hebrews. Even though he's pretty much finished his main points, he's still got a lot of important things to, to say here. And so again, he's talking about faith in the context of the finished work of Christ and everything that Christ has accomplished. And so this is where faith gets uh, get, gets positioned in, in its right foundation, its right piece, okay? And we need to understand the full picture in order to really understand what faith is. Because again, so many of our teachings in the church and Christianity come out on faith come out of Hebrews 11. A lot of it does, a lot of stuff. And so, but without understanding the context, okay, I said that all already, it doesn't, it, it doesn't totally fit. So um, this is important because faith, can very easily become another system of works. Okay, so we're really good in the Protestant church of saying, okay, we're done with outward legalistic works. We don't need to, you know, do all these outward legalistic things, the law stuff, you know, all the stuff that the law required in order to be pure and accepted by God. But what we're not good at in the Protestant church is getting rid of inward legalistic works. So we might not have outward stuff like, okay, we all know that we can eat we can eat ham for Christmas. <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're free from the law in that sense. So we, we're, we're, we're not under the, the bondage of the outward law. But what happens in Christianity is that we can come into inward bondage, inward legalism, where faith becomes a work, okay? Faith becomes this striving thing that we need to work up in our lives. And so we're, we're, we're not straining and striving outwardly, beating ourselves up with whips to get God to accept us, but we do beat ourselves up inwardly with these inward whips to get ourselves in shape, to build up our faith. And, um, you know, a lot of this comes out of uh, the Word of Faith movement. And, and let me just say that the Word of Faith movement was without a doubt inspired by the Holy Spirit, for those of you who are familiar with the Word of Faith, and, and a lot of incredible things came out of the Word of Faith. If you're familiar with Kenneth Hagin and, um, and some other teachers from, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, who taught a lot about faith, um, really good stuff. I, a lot of my initial growth as a, as a, as a newborn believer in Christ was through reading Kenneth Hagin books. I mean, that jump-started my faith was reading Kenneth Hagin. Um, so they teach a lot about this subject. But there is very much a subtle legalism <laughs> that creeps into the Word of Faith movement that really brought a lot of disappointment to people, a lot of strife in people's hearts, and a lot of division and things that, you know, we just... <coughs> We, we just um, have a tendency as as human beings to just take pure revelation, awesome stuff, and add our own control and, and systems to it. So um, anyway, that happens with the Word of Faith movement where it became very much about, you know, okay, the whole name it and claim it thing, that if you just have enough faith, you know, you just work it up enough, I can just finally speak to that mountain and I can finally muster up a mustard seed of faith and really strive and strain to get that amount of energy out that can change circumstances in my life. And, and people very much turn the message inward, okay? It was never meant to be turned inward. <coughs> it was never meant for us to turn it into a personal work, okay? I believe the original message of the Word of Faith movement was about who Christ is and what Christ has done and getting our focus on that and away from ourselves. But again, we always have the tendency, the early church did it, the, the Hebrew Christians did it that he's writing to, we have a tendency to turn it on ourselves. And so something Kenneth Hagin taught that I loved was that um, he taught about the issue of inheritance. And I've said this before. He said how, you know, if you had a million dollars in the bank that your grandfather left to you, but if you were never told about that inheritance, if you were never told you had that million dollars in the bank and you were deceived into thinking that it wasn't there, well, you would live your life in a much different mindset, a much different way than you would if you knew that you had a million dollars in the bank. 
And so the whole point of, of a lot of his teachings, a lot of the Word of Faith teachings, was, was to say, guess what? By the blood of Christ, this is all that you have in your bank account. Okay, you have healing in your bank account. You have forgiveness in your bank account. You have prosperity in your bank account. You have God's grace and his presence, constant abiding presence and mercy in the midst of any, you know, any suffering or any difficult time. You have supernatural power. You have all this stuff in your bank account. And this is what we need to realize. This is what we need to come in touch with. And once you realize how much of a millionaire you are, it changes your perspective. It changes your attitude towards life. You know, if you had a million dollars in the bank, you would have a much different attitude towards crises, crises in your life and, you know, boilers breaking and car parts, you know, coming, breaking down and, and issues happening. You know, if you had that, if you had more of that mindset that you were rich, you know, that would, that would change your attitude. So when we realize that we're rich in Christ, it changes our attitude on things. So I think that was really good. I think that's great that, that he was opening up, the Word of Faith movement opens up our heart to more of the fullness of, of what we have in Christ. But the subtle danger that happens is where we begin to say, okay, now I need to pump up enough effort to make um, withdrawals from that account. And it's all on me to get withdrawals from the account. And that's, I don't believe that's what faith is. Okay, faith is simply a realization. It's an awakening or a revelation, an opening of the eyes of your heart to what you have. So l l let me just let me just touch on this for a little bit, and then we'll actually get in into the into the text of what he's saying. Okay. The main context of this is Christ's work, his finished work, and what he's accomplished for us: redemption. Faith then is how we enjoy these realities, okay? His work is finished, and it's true whether we believe it or not, okay? Now, this is the beautiful freeing thing when you get this in your heart. This is where you just, the lights go on, and you just soar with this. Like, whether you believe it or not, this, the work that Christ has accomplished is, is true for you. It's truth. It is completely true whether you have enough intellectual, emotional, spiritual ability to believe it or not, it's already true. So faith is simply you becoming aware of what is already true. It's you enjoying what you already have. So you are saved by grace through faith, it says. Meaning faith is how you enjoy your salvation, but you're already saved by grace. You're not saved by your own works, okay? By your own faith, you're saved by Christ's grace. You understand? Okay? You are saved by his grace alone. There's nothing you can boast in. See, what the Protestant church has done, what a lot of evangelical Christians have done, is they've, 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 they've put the one work that we need to do for salvation, and that is you need to believe. Okay? But what that does, think about this, is that isolates a whole population of people from salvation. Okay? For instance, that isolates every aborted baby, that's one thing, or every child that died before the age of, you know, reason. That isolates every person in every country that never heard the gospel, including Japan, that never even heard about the gospel for 1,200 years up until when they got there. So all those Japanese people, you know, according to this mindset that you need to believe in Jesus in order to be saved, okay, all those people are frying in, in hell right now. And it, and it rules out all of the... Um, all of the mentally ill and the schizophrenic and people that can't even, you know, can't even muster up belief. Okay, so you're isolating all that and you're saying that, okay, all those people, you know, they're going to have to find their own way. Or we come up with our own doctrines and say, okay, well, God's going to accept them. You know, he'll accept the aborted babies. He'll accept, you know, the mentally ill and all that stuff. But you right here with the choice, you know, uh, come on, I'd rather be aborted if that was the issue, <laughs> you know. I'm sorry. I know that's really crude. But I'd rather be mentally ill and aborted if that's going to get me a free pass into billions of years of life and health. Okay, I'll take an abortion over. Come on, listen, I know this is horrible, but do you understand my logic? You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so we've taken faith and we've made it the one work that we need to do. Okay, you don't need to abstain from pork and get circumcised and all that stuff. But you do need to have enough intellectual ability to believe. And once you <coughs> muster up the belief, you make the choice. You have then purchased your salvation. But that's not the truth. You are saved by great. You're already saved. And guess what? Faith is you simply becoming aware of it. Because faith comes by hearing the word. 
okay? Faith doesn't come by your own effort. Faith is simply the result of hearing the word. So the word of truth comes to you, and you simply become aware of it. Now, you can choose to reject the word, and that's where, you know, some of these concepts on hell and stuff comes in because you can choose to reject it. You can be shown your salvation and the gift you have and your place, and you can. And it's the mystery of iniquity. Um, Revelation talks about. You know, it's just it's crazy that people would do this, but you know, you can reject the gift. You can make that choice to reject it, but you can do nothing to earn it. It's already it's already yours. Okay. So faith is simply you enjoying what you already have. That's it. It's you being told, listen, you have healing in Christ. You have salvation in Christ. You have, and, and it's you coming into a revelation. And it's really a gift, I believe. Like, you can't muster this up. It's good to sit under teachings that preach on the finished work of the cross. It's good to read scriptures about it because faith comes by hearing. So the more that you hear, you know, good teaching on the word, the more faith will happen. But you can't even produce faith, I don't believe. I don't even, it's, there's even a scripture that says faith is a gift. We've talked about this before. Um, in fact, I remember, Frank, I remember you had some thoughts on, I think, a part in Romans where it says the measure of of faith. We had talked about this one time. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been given the measure of faith, it says. Not a measure, the measure of faith. We've been, faith, <coughs> faith, faith is a gift. So this is so frustrating because it takes all the control out of our hands. What do you mean it's not something that I can do? No, faith is simply, it's, it's a gift of revelation that comes as you are presented the word of God and as you learn the truth about God's love, as you encounter God, However that happens, through prayer, through a church service, through his word, through life, circumstances, whatever, you encounter God and it breeds a new revelation in your life of, wow, this is who God is, this is who I am, this is what I have, and that's, and your faith begins to grow. All right, so let me pause, okay? I, I could keep going, but that's, that's, it's pretty heavy stuff. So I would love to hear some feedback or thoughts or, all right, something. Because I, I can feel some wrestling, some, you know, some, some stuff going on, questions. I feel them. Yeah. I feel like I need so much of that in so many areas of my life. But I know where you're going, and I have, like, the greatest example. I was sick one time. It was years and years ago, and I had something important the next day. I don't know if it was a job interview or what, but it was important. And I was laying in bed, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and, like, I was nauseous. And I know, like, once this hits me, like, I, I was gone for the next day. And I knew that if God didn't heal me, I wasn't going to be able to do what I had to do the next day. <clears throat> and so I prayed for God to heal me, and he did it. And so I said, all right, got to get more faith. And I lay there, like, trying to, like, muster up more faith. And I prayed for God to heal me, and he did it. And then I tried to muster up more faith, and I prayed for God to heal me, and he did it. And finally I said, God, I don't have enough faith. On the basis of your mercy and grace, will you come to me? And bam, I just felt it. Wow. And wow. That's the difference between trying to, like, muster up faith. Like, like faith is a, was a work. Like, I yeah. had to have enough of it, and I had to work enough of it up. Yeah. And, and as soon as I gave up, and relied on his mercy and relied on his grace. I, I just, I just, it's like, I think it's the only time really in my life where, where I just felt that real like healing just come through. Wow. Wow. That's you know awesome. Like, I feel like in so many other areas I need to learn that, not just like for, for physical healing, but you know, emotional healing, mental healing. I feel there's still a lot I need to grasp. Yeah. Yeah. But that, Mind, that's all what a cool testimony yeah, that's great. and that's such a because you did you turn the focus away from yourself on who god is it wasn't about you and your yeah wow yeah frank kind of like in conjunction with that part of the problem with the, the faith movement and what it turned into yeah. Yeah. was that if for some reason you didn't receive the prop there was a problem with you Yes. You, you you either had sin in your life. Or yes. You weren't Thank you. Properly, or yeah. And, and it all became it became even more about you. Yeah. Which kind of like complicated things because now you got to figure out what am I doing wrong as, in, 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 in addition to trying to believe for what I need. Wow. Wow. So it, yeah. It just really got very convoluted. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. That's exactly what I was trying to get at before that it did it, it yeah it bred all this condemnation and self-focus and yeah it's horrible i work with the development of disabled yeah adults and it makes me feel better just what you said about you know the board is 
babies yeah. I mean, is God good or what? Like, he's just, <laughs> he's good. And it just amazes he's, me that no matter what we do as people through the last, you know, through since the beginning, it's just all God. And we, no matter what we try to figure out and box up and make it work, it doesn't work for <laughs> So, you know, as God continues to shine his light through centuries of different things that we've tried to... <laughs> muster up or figure out or have a system god just continues to disable that and say no you know so as you, that's not it it's yeah. just god there's nothing else to it yeah like not to sound disrespectful mm -hmm. but there's nothing else to it it's all god it's all jesus it's done yeah so when you were talking <laughs> um when you, disrespectful well it's not a disrespectful term well i don't want to sound disrespectful so just to just um, see the attitude I got. Right. Um, but when you were talking, all I kept thinking was, "It's just resting. It's yeah. just resting. Yes. You know? It's just resting in who God is. Yeah. And the more we do that, the more we know yes. who He is, and the more we know who mm -hmm. He is, the more we rest. And yeah. it's when I get out of that and start to and forget that I start to rely on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So it just doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's pretty cool is that God has given us this gift of faith, understanding that we would be struggling with it because we don't see a lot of the things he talks about. Mm -hmm. Which I think is pretty cool. He's like, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm going to give you faith. Hmm. Yeah. What was that? <laughs> you know, feedback, I think. And... Um, <laughs> I know, it's, it's just like God's like, you talk about the gift of faith, and it's like, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Yeah. And it, and it talks about, you know, blessed are those who've seen me, but especially blessed are those who've never seen me. But yeah. Believe. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, God's made a provision for that for us. Yeah. We don't have to add on to it. He'll just let us know. Yeah. You know, and I love it. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, I like that. That's a good question. Um, you mentioned before something about what about the people in Japan that haven't heard for X amount of years. Yeah. What What do you think happens to the souls of people that never heard? That's a good question. I I I don't want to totally go there right now because that gets into speculation and stuff. I I, I always kind of um, concede to the reality that <coughs> God is good and He finds a way through life and death and. You know, I, I do know that Jesus, it says that he went and he preached to the souls, you know, who were dead in prison and, and he really, you know, he opened the gates of hell, you know, he opened that up. So I, I, I think that there's, um, I think there's a lot more going on even after death than we realize with, with, in the heavenly realm with Christ and, it, and it's not necessarily as final as we think. And before I go too far with that and get too controversial with no, it, I'm okay, going to, I'm going to. you said that, it just hit me. The three days that he was gone, yeah. Who's to say he didn't include everybody, past, present, and future? future. Yeah, right. yeah. Of our limited thinking, because it's outside of time, yeah. and yeah. Because why? Because he, because in one sense, how can I believe that God is a just God if the people never heard of him, never had a chance mm -hmm. to believe in him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. So that's just yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's controversial. It's, yeah, it's. It takes the brain and it, the heart, and the heart goes jumps, and your brain goes, "What the heck is going on?" Yeah, you yeah. Have that? And then your brain yeah. starts making you doubt, and the heart's going, "No, it's it's a lot of fun." Yeah. But that's interesting. Yeah, I never thought of that. Tom, that's a really good point because mm -hmm. our our heart does go out to this, and um, mm -hmm. and and then our mind wants to argue with all the different all the scriptures and different oh. things that contradict it. But yeah, I, I just I, I think there's a lot more going on. You know that Jesus opened up the gates. Of hell, they're they're not shut anymore. Mm -hmm. I really believe that people shut themselves in. You know, I've, I've quoted C.S. Lewis a million times with that that the gates of hell are locked from the inside, so people wow. lock themselves yeah, in. So, so I think when people die and all these people see this white light, just I just think that's because Jesus opened up the door. They're just he he is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not preaching this universal message of you know every way is the right way. Jesus is the only way. But guess what? That way is huge. <laughs> he is the he opened wow. up the door, and that's why everybody sees light. You know. That just really so, it. yeah. The three days he was gone, past, present, present. Oh, He now has the cool. keys of death and Hades. Mm -hmm. He took. 
those away, yeah. <laughs> One more thing, I yeah. know you don't want to stay on the topic, but yeah. the verse that really bothers me is like, narrow is the way that leads to life, and yeah. broad is the way that leads to destruction. And yeah. It really bothers me, because I think, wow, like, there's going to be, like, so many more people in hell than, than there are in heaven. Yeah, okay, so, all right, let me, let me, let me speak on that, because I have talked about that in the past, so let me just hit on that, um, and, then, and then we'll get back into this. So, narrow is the way. And, you know, how's the rest of it go? And Narrow is the way that leads to life, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Is the road that leads to so destruction. Okay, I want to make sure I had it right. Um, first of all, you need to understand that Jesus is coming as a rabbi, teaching the Jewish people about the futility of their own law, their own um, religious system to enter into God's presence, Okay. And really, the narrow way, I believe, the narrow way into heaven is, is the only way, which is the way of Christ. Now, the whole world, the, actually, I would say the broad road that the world walks on is the way of law and the way of religion. Okay, So the whole world tries to find life through you know, beating themselves up in some form or another, finding nirvana, finding a better reincarnation. If you do all the right things, you treat people the right way, you, bet, you get a better reincarnation. If you meditate enough and ascend, you know, and in, in get, your, get your chakras in order and all that stuff, you'll, you'll, you'll reach nirvana and all this stuff. Or if you're a Christian, you know, or Catholic or whatever, if you do X, Y, and Z, you know, you, you, you go to confession, you get your confirmation, all that stuff, you'll, you'll end. You know, so we, we have law, right? We have all these things that we do, whether you're, Eastern religion or Western religion, there's all this stuff. And uh, that is the broad road. I believe the narrow road is the road of faith in Christ alone. And I think he's making a general statement about how, you know, this whole world goes in the path of destruction through religion and through law. And he's really, you know, if you read that whole, the whole thing in context, like the Sermon on the Mount, he's really frustrating the people because they thought the Jews at that time thought they had it together you know they were they were fulfilling the law you know they weren't committing adultery they weren't murdering one another they got rid of all the idols from Israel so Jesus just amps it up a whole new level to them he's like fine you're not committing adultery or murder great but if you even wink at that dirty magazine in the convenience store you're uh, you're already guilty of, of breaking the law if you even think call somebody an idiot you know you're you're guilty of murdering that person in your heart. So what he does, I believe Jesus frustrates our law system. You know, he just frustrates us and he makes us realize that you have to give up and that's the narrow way. Is you giving up on your own efforts, your own broad path to destruction to find him. But I don't think that's necessarily a statement about, you know, how many people are going to end up in hell. He's doing a teaching there about the broad road of this world that leads to destruction compared to the, the narrow path that only he could walk on. He's the only one that walked down that path. And we're, we're in him. So he brought us with him in, in, into that place. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I've kind of given up on that mindset a long time ago that, that hell is going to be way more overpopulated than heaven. Like, to me, that, that gives no glory to God by any means that that's how this this thing is gonna is gonna wrap up and make it just well that makes sense too Nick because in our worldly mind who would ever think that the way to be in a relationship with the God who created the universe would be through a baby born in a manger like yeah. that's that whole upside down kingdom thing you know yeah. like everything that you would think of it is yeah you know like yeah that, that that Jesus came and as a babe and lived as a man and yeah. you know took all of our sins and it just the whole thing is so mind blowing so yeah. it just fits what you're saying yeah all of our earthly figuring out is dopey yeah yeah right now? exactly yeah. you have to always read Jesus you have to read him in the Gospels through a full understanding of the new covenant and what was revealed by the Holy Spirit after Christ resurrected. Because Jesus didn't really preach grace until he died on the cross. I mean, he didn't. He was a law preacher through and through. He came and lived the law, preached the law, and he brought us to the utmost maximum of the law in order to realize that we need to give up and trust in him as our Savior. He preached the law. And so you need to, again, this is all goes back to the context of the scriptures. If you read the red letters of Jesus and that's it, and you think they're more anointed than Paul or Peter later, then you're in for a, a horrible roller coaster experience of Christianity. Because guess what? They're all red letters. It's all the word of God. 
and the full counsel of God is this whole revelation, this crazy upside down revelation of what Jesus has done for us. And so um, I, I think the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, because that's what you're quoting, he, he's, he's, he's bringing them to an end of themselves right there. And he's showing them, listen, there's only one way and, and, it's, and it's me. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Does that help you? Set free. It's helping. Okay. It's helping. <laughs> it's an ongoing no, activity okay. in her heart. But that is a great place to be. Because God is going to reveal to you where you want you to sit. Yeah. And it's going to be like that night when you're laying in bed and you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he teaches on faith to them. Because remember, he's writing to Jewish Christians who they no longer are going to see a physical high priest working in the physical temple. And as such, they could not come to a physical temple to approach God anymore. Right? Oh. So so this is a whole new dimension of living for them. Okay, They were used to having outward things to go to to find relief from their sins and their guilt and their closeness with God. They don't have those outward things anymore. And so they still wanted to go to the temple, you know? And... Um, and this is true for many Christians today. A lot of Christians can't find peace with God unless they go to a church, you know? And that's <laughs> that that's not I just laugh because it's so funny saying this, you know, as, as like a pastor, but like that that is temple thinking. That's old Judaic thinking, okay? Church should be a celebration coming together to be with the body of Christ as family. That's what church is, you know. So it's great to go to a building to find edification and family. But a lot of people have the mentality that I need to go to the the priest or the pastor, I need to go here to find my connection with God. And no, you have a connection with God on your toilet seat just as much as you do in that pew down, downstairs. I so, so, my toilet seat. so it's just, you know. But you know, the church so. is a living thing. It's living. It's not a building. Right. You build or right. what you think God would like and then you go to it. Yeah. You're right. It's a living thing. So. <laughs> so anyway, he is therefore, he's teaching them a new dynamic on living their lives outside of the temple system because he also knows that they're going to be scattered soon. Rome's coming in, they're going to destroy it all, they're going to be scattered. They're not going to have this physical priest to talk to. They're not going to they're going to have this totally new system going on and it's going to be a system built upon faith. And so he's teaching them this dynamic that will be important to all of us from for 2000 years after this book was written. And um he does this by showing them the heroes of the Bible. So the heroes of the Bible, you know, he starts with all, you know, he goes faith, and he, uh, he talks about by the faith, Abel offered um, to God things, uh, a better sacrifice than Cain. He talks about by faith, Enoch was taken up. He talks about, I'm not going to read all of this, okay? Um, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. Okay, you, you can go through all of this yourself. Read it. It's just awesome stuff that he just, he, he's, remember, he's writing to Jews. They knew these stories. They were told these stories every Saturday their whole life growing up. They were, they were, they had to memorize them from the age of like five. And, um, and so they know these stories. And so he's appealing to all these people that did stuff without seeing the reality. So he's, you know, he's speaking their language. He's getting them, he's, he's showing them, listen, this isn't like something new. This God has been doing this all along, faith. But, you know, he's helping them let go, all right? He's let, helping them let go by, by appealing to them by people who they look up to, like Abraham and Moses and all these people that did stuff without seeing the full promise. So they're like, even though you don't see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, you know, physically, you don't see your high priest with your physical eyes, you know, blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. You know, you're going you're gonna to walk in this reality. You're going to have a faith walk in all of this, okay? And yet... The writer makes a distinction between the heroes of faith and the believer in Christ, okay? We are different than these people that he's mentioning here. We're in a far better position than them, okay? All of them died in faith without receiving the promises, all right? But we have received the promises, okay? And I'll explain that in a little bit. Jesus said in Matthew eleven eleven, he said, John the Baptist is the greatest man to have ever lived, but... The least in the kingdom of God from here on out is going to be greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus said John the Baptist is greater than Moses, Noah, Abraham, all these people. He was the greatest to come, the greatest prophet, yea, more than a prophet. But I tell you, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Why is that? Because they were all waiting for something to come. In Christ, it has come 
already. The promise has come in Christ, okay? We received it. We have received the promise. And again, it's finished and it's done. So it says in the last, let me read to you the last two verses of Hebrews 11. This is important here. It says that these people were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Now remember, Hebrews 10.14 says we were made perfect, past tense. We were perfected in Christ, okay? Christ has accomplished redemption for us. It's done, okay? We have been made perfect in Christ. Our redemption is finished. If you read Luke chapter 1, chapter 2, the the Christmas story, the birth, the foretelling of Jesus' birth, it's crazy because it all talks about how God has accomplished redemption for his people. Past tense. Redemption has come in Christ. And so faith then becomes the substance of things hoped for, okay? In other words, hoped for realities that Abraham and others hoped for, okay, but have come to pass in Christ, all right, faith becomes the awareness, the evidence, or the ground of things that are not seen, but yet they're completely true and completely present in heavenly places in Christ, okay? So what I want you to see is that, is that the work is finished and that the promise has come. Redemption has been accomplished in Christ. We're not waiting anymore. We're resting, okay? We're, we're realizing things that are already true. We already have a heavenly city. See, these people, he says in in the first part of Hebrews, um, he says they were waiting for a city to come. They desired a better country, a heavenly one. It says in Hebrews 12 that we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the heavenly city. So these realities have all come to pass in Christ. We have it all. We're at a much better place than them. However, faith is still important because we don't see it all manifested yet. Okay, It's not totally revealed yet but it's still true okay it wasn't true for them back in the day they were waiting and hoping for something to happen it happened already it's sealed by the blood of jesus it's done okay we're we're not hoping that something good happens we're just it's it's already accomplished you see you see the distinction there okay there, there's there's it there's so many people in this world that live in such insecurity with their religion. They're like, okay, I think I have the right religion. I think I know what's going to happen when I die. You know, I hope that, you know, there's a God after, after this death, or I hope there's eternal life after. We don't have that wishy-washy hope anymore. It's finished. The resurrection of Jesus is an established historical fact. It's done. Okay. You don't have to have this wishy-washy hope anymore for something. It's an established fact. It's over. And so faith is not so much as just wishing for something, but it's, it's realizing something. So again, this all goes back to this understanding that faith is simply an opening of our eyes to what is already true. And that takes the work off of our shoulders. Okay? That takes, because if this is already true, if this has already happened, it's done, it's sealed, then there's nothing you need to do. There's nothing you need to do to add to it. It's already true. And so faith is you becoming aware of it. So in the middle paragraph there is our eyes are open to the truth and we see it with the eyes of our hearts. This revelation becomes the substance and the evidence of our perfection in Christ. Okay, it, there, there becomes substance to it as we become aware of, what, of who we are in Christ and what has been accomplished. Faith releases that reality in our lives. Okay? But the good thing is is that we don't have to be condemned if we're not walking out our full perfection in Christ. Even though we're perfect in Christ, if you're still living in some kind of imperfection or some kind of struggle, you don't need to have condemnation or worry or say, okay, I guess my faith isn't enough because that's not the point. The point is that this is what God says about you and it's his opinion that matters, not your experience. You know, not, not what you think about yourself, not what you see. It's what God believes that matters. It's the faith of Christ that matters, not not the faith of Frank or the faith of Nick, okay? It's the faith of Christ that matters. And all throughout the Bible, you hear that, the faith of God, okay? Our modern translations change it to say faith in God, but the original Greek was the faith of God, okay? We, again, we change it. We say in, and that puts the work on us. The NIV and a lot of these newer translations put the work on us. They say have faith in God. Jesus actually said have the faith of God. So it's his faith. It's what he believes. It's not yours. So we, like, like, you know, this prayer that we heard about before, we, 
we strive to get our faith in God enough. If we have enough faith in God, we can then move the mountain. But the problem is we're trying to muster up something that God never intended us for do. He, he wanted us to have the faith of God, which is outside our control. It's what he already believes. It's who he is. So that, that was a great story before because it pointed to the fact that, okay, this is about God. It's about his mercy. It's about his grace. I will save you for my namesake, not for anything else. For, for my namesake, I will, I will do these things. So it's all a shift. That's, that's this, this major shift that God is, God is uh, doing. So the, the last part here is that the reward has come, okay? The reward is Christ. All throughout Scripture, you see God saying, I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your inheritance, okay? Our reward has already come. And, uh, and, and, I, and I put this in here so much because Christians have such a tendency to be so heaven-focused and so future-focused and so looking for our reward in heaven that we miss out on the fact of what we have now, okay? Um, we have the greatest part of heaven now, okay? The Holy Spirit is God. I want you to know that in heaven, the greatest thing that's going to captivate your attention and your presence is not going to be your gold mansion, okay? It's not going to be your emerald, diamond, ruby uh, slippers. It's not going to be, you know, your crazy heavenly creature that you, that you walk around, the pet that you have or something in heaven, your unicorn you're flying around. It's going to be God, okay? God is going to be your greatest reward in heaven. It's going to be your greatest joy, your greatest high, your greatest fascination. And you already have God now. You already, you already have the best part of heaven now. And, um, and this is why I believe, this is the last thing I'll say here with this, this is why I really believe John the Apostle said that faith overcomes the world. When your eyes are truly open to the beauty and the work of Christ, and when we see that clearly, there is a place of complete peace that we have that transcends our understanding, and it allows us to, to enjoy the greatest part of heaven now, which is God. Um, I think I've said this before, that the renewed mind overcomes the world. When your mind is renewed to the truth, there is no stress, there is no struggle, there's no problem that can shake you that you're because because your mind is is fixed on the truth that it's finished that it's done that you're with god you're in god and and the victory is already accomplished that's a process you know that's a journey of getting there okay and there's moments where we have the faith activated in us and we're at total peace and joy and then there's moments where it's like we completely forget everything that we learned everything that god taught us and we're freaking out and we're afraid and we're begging God to help us and our prayers become very orphan mentality, begging God for bread, hoping for, and then there's times where our faith is so strong and we know we're sons and daughters of the house and we got nothing to worry about and we don't even pray for ourselves, we just pray for other people because we're so at peace, you know, that's the difference, you know, you could always judge where your faith level's at by how much you're praying for yourself and how much you're praying for other people because when you're struggling in faith, you pray for yourself a lot, but when you're just, you realize like God's got it all covered, you start to like worry about other people <laughs> it's pretty cool it's freeing it's awesome so um faith overcomes the world faith is a beautiful thing but again faith is not in your hands faith is the truth of what christ has accomplished okay faith is is very often referred to as a message in scripture the message of christ the faith of christ it's 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 the word of truth that comes to you and so god's doing it he's he's opening our eyes he's um He's showing us the realities of his word, and we're just, we don't get it all yet. We don't understand it all totally, but he's, he's doing it in our hearts, and it's really it's so freeing. It's so amazing to see what, see what that is. So any, any comments on that, on that last part there, on, on faith overcoming the world or on, um, you know, the hope of heaven now or, any, you know, anything along those lines? What can we do to get there? <laughs> What's the magic formula? <laughs> How can I pray more? How can I pray more? How can I do it? Thanks for voicing what every religious demon is whispering in people's minds right now. Well, right? It's not part of me. I'm okay with that. <laughs> no, really, that's... That's what that's what that's what happens with me when I hear messages like this. I'm like, okay, what do I need to do to rest? And rest becomes a work. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a total contradiction. 
but really, what Jenny said before, that fa- it really is rest. I mean, and I've heard that before, that I love this one definition of faith, that the flavor of faith is rest. It's just resting, okay? Something that's already true, okay? I'm not trying to believe in a chair underneath me. It's just there. I can, so let me just enjoy the chair, right? So I have salvation underneath me. I've got all the grace of God, all his presence and everything, and I, like, try to believe it. And I try, What do I need to do to situate myself? Like, but it's, I'm already seated. <laughs> I'm already seated with Christ, and you just, you just... Yeah, right? I'm walking around. I'm looking for the chair. How do I find the chair? How do I purchase the chair? But you're already on the chair. And you just you can either begin enjoying it and rocking in it or or resting. I'm not going to beat this horse down that bad. But, you know, it's, it's got to gotta drill it in our heads sometimes. I, I find with me, um, I still have guilt over not thinking I'm doing enough yeah. for God. Not for me, it's like if I'm at work, do I share the gospel with this person? Do I don't share the gospel with this person? Pray for this person or don't I pray for this person? And it becomes like your head starts spinning. And it's just me trying to do something that God doesn't want me to do. It's, yeah. So that's where the mind God gives me a revelation sometimes and my mind takes over. Yeah. And I start going into this like scenario. Yeah. I, I, I'm like, shut up, Tom. Just stop. You don't have to. Don't work. Stop. Just do what I tell you to do. I go, okay, okay. But you, that's what happens with us. Our, mind, our heart hears a message. Your spirit jumps, and then your mind gets wacky sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you're worried about what people are going to think. You're worried about all the things around you that influence you. And you need to find out, again, when Jenny said about that rest in God, that you could just know where that's where you're supposed to be at at that moment with Him. Yeah. Because the other day I'm, dri- I'm driving the car yesterday and he said, shut the radio off. What? Oh, come on. I, I, just, I just shut the radio off. So I shut the radio off. I thought That's that, a miracle in and of itself. And I thought I was going to get a revelation. <laughs> you know, also, my mind goes, oh, wow, okay, just do it. <laughs> Nothing happened. I just got quiet for like half an hour. Okay. Turn it back on and blah, blah. And then on the way home, something else happened to me. But it was just, just those little things that God just might say for you to do. Just like, shut it off, relax for a while. Okay. It was kind of weird having it quiet for a while. But, was, but that's... And another thing is, God gives you a revelation of how he talks to you. Embrace that for the moment, and then be open to different ways he talks to you. Mm-hmm. Don't make that revelation, oh, this is how I get the guy. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. You don't have the you don't have the handle. God talks to you through the toilet bowl, to <laughs> to, to through anything. You know, it just it, what? It's, yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, it sounds weird, but it's the God the honest mm-hmm. truth. I mean, and you just got to be open to hearing Him and everything. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it when that happens. I feel more and more like well, a knucklehead. One other time, of, you know, if you even you have that revelation, but to build on it from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I believe I really believe God wants to do that with us. He doesn't want us mm-hmm. to get stuck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He really does. He doesn't want us to make an altar out of something. He wants yeah. us to like, oh wow, okay, great. What? Well, all right. So it becomes part of you, but it doesn't become the thing you worship, that yeah. idol in your life. Mm-hmm. Some people's praying three hours in the morning and if they miss their three hours they live in guilt because they don't hear God the rest of the day or whatever that is that keeps you from hearing God, that's something that you just need to ask God to help you with. Yeah. And uh he will. He does. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Pretty neat. Oh, you'll be talking about that next time. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing God. Oh, God, I can hear it now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was on the toilet bowl. God said go when I went. Hallelujah. That happened to me. Stop. That happened to me once. Oh, that's funny. Uh, story uh, next time. No, I, I, that's enough. Thank you. I was a young Christian. Stop. <laughs> I was a young Christian and God said go to Bible school, so I'm sharing it with uh, the group of people at the time. And, uh, I said, well, you know, I, w- I was in the bathroom, and God said go. And so I I went. And everybody's laughing at me, because I didn't just, I didn't tie in being the, my mouth. And that was funny. I said, well, you really obeyed God, Tom. I go, yeah, I went to Bible school. They, no, they go, like, forget it, Tom. <laughs> It's, it's fun. It, gets, it gets really weird. It's Were you going to say something? Yeah, I wanted to share what um, he, he he mentioned before that um, at work, like sometimes you you 
like the thoughts come to you that what should I do with this person, yeah. that person, you know, it's like that need need to be doing. And and I I had <clears throat> that problem for many years. And I just for the past year I for whatever reason, you know, I, I just think God is amazing because God has always reminded me that I don't have to do anything. And it just brings so much peace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like even sometimes I hear, I get e- we get emails and stuff, and I'm like, what should I do? Like the first thing in my mind is, what should I do? And then for whatever reason, God has been, has so much grace. Because like lately, I just, he constantly reminds me. Yeah. I don't want you to do anything. It's, or, or like, you know, he just gave me that peace. And, and, I, and I, I find more peace in that area more than anything yeah. even with my family yeah. was, like I just I can go to him and say Lord what would you like me to do and just have that peace that he will reveal either by someone coming to me and saying maybe you need to do this or whatever or maybe just God giving me um, like revelation of to where how should I approach it or not but it's not like me immediately trying to jump into and create a little plan <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know what? Which I, I I literally used to hate it and that really literally got me sick. That's such yeah. a stress. Isn't it? It's yeah. just but I I, I, I I do feel like more peace in that area yeah. than That's anything good. else. I really do. And it's so amazing. Yeah. It is so amazing. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I, I I read a prophetic word one time by this guy, Francis Frangipane, and he talked about how he just said this one line stood out to me. He said peace before power and rest before rule and his whole point was that God is establishing us in simple friendship with him in this season this was a few years ago but I think we're still in that season I think that's God's agenda is to establish us in this peace now like what if that was God's agenda for the church it was you know we all about mobilization what if God wants to immobilize the church for a season <laughs> it was immobil- a immobilization right <laughs> just so we don't you know just to get that but his whole point was like Peace comes before authority, before we can, you know, God has all these great things he wants to release through the church, prophetic, you know, stuff that he wants to do and, you know, healings and miracles and evangelizing the nation, all that stuff. But but before you can step into that authority, you need to have peace. And that was the whole thing. Peace, and he talked about peace is simply the fruit of being confident in God's love for you. That's it. And so, yeah, that was kind of his title to it. Yeah. Peace comes before that that power, and rest comes before rule. So that it so flows what you're saying out. is we can't do anything to make happen what we think God wants to have happen unless we rest in what He wants to do. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I think it makes sense to me. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, in other words, rest from your freaking words and trust in the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Thus saith the prophet Tom. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, All right. Prophetic word. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I Thanks everyone for uh, uh, the thoughts and the so sharing and. Um, <laughs>